Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, episode 235, The Book of Lost Tales 2. Greta? Hey. How in the world are you? What'd you say? How in the world are you? How the world are you? How in the world are you? Oh, I <laughs> how are the world? I'm like, what? Okay. Um, good. I'm really good. Excellent. Yeah. How about yourself? How are you? Doing doing mighty fine. Good. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a yeah. Friday. I mean. Woke up alive this morning after crazy storms crazy yesterday. Crazy storms. So. Dude. I, how big do you think that hail was that came through? It was large. Glad it wasn't outside. It sounded really big. Yeah. Like really big. I was hoping to see some of it, but it doesn't hang around long, does it? There wasn't like any signs of it. Hell yeah, it was big. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On this episode, we are continuing our tour of the History of Middle Earth series as we survey the Book of Lost Tales 2. Before we get started, we'd like to give a shout out to our patrons. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, Caitlin of T with Tolkien, Elise Yu, Andrew T, John R, and Ms. Anonymous. And a big shout out to our newest patrons, Jacob S. and Daria. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you both so much for becoming patrons. We greatly appreciate it. Very much. You too can become a patron of the Tolkien Road by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Becoming a patron lets you support the show in a tangible way and lands you some awesome perks like video recordings of our episodes. Check it out now to learn more about all the exciting perks we offer. And don't forget, you can now make an annual pledge and get one month free. You can also support the show by you can also support the Tolkien Road by leaving us a one-time tip. Just look in the show notes on your podcatcher for the leave a tip link or head on over to tolkienroad.com and look for the blue leave a tip button. We love it. We prefer when people become patrons, but we understand not everybody can, and so a, uh, leaving us a tip is a perfectly awesome way to uh, to support the show. So for sure, thank you for whatever way you choose. Um, iTunes and other podcast podcatching platforms. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. Um, leaving us a five star rating and a review helps get the word out about us. We got a couple of recent five star reviews. Oh, wanted to um, read these on air in gratitude, as we always do when we get a uh, a cool review. So, the first one was on March nineteenth, and this is from uh, uh, the subject is thanks and says uh, in the it's from Jargal. Ma, I think I'm saying that right, but Jackie in parentheses, so we'll call it, we'll refer to this person as Jackie. They say, hello, I've been listening to your podcast since last fall. I like your podcast. I'm a new fan of Tolkien and really passionate about his, about his legends. Good luck, guys. Tolkien fan from Mongolia. I'm just oh, like, whoa, Mongolia. That's so cool. That is, that's totally awesome. That is really cool. Uh, I, you, I don't know if you're our first only listener in Mongolia, but, um, I'm just, it, it's really cool to think of somebody listening to us from uh, somewhere that feels as far away as Mongolia. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that's like Asia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mon- Mongolia is a country between, uh, between China and Russia. So like Eastern, gotcha. Eastern wow. Russia. That yeah. is like literally believe, on the other side of the world. I believe I've got that geography right. My, my apologies if I don't, but I'm just going from what I remember. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Mongolia is, uh, yeah, it's that's it's really cool. So, uh, um, I guess thank you for being from Mongolia <laughs> and then leaving yeah. us a review. So. For sure, that's really really um, cool. Yeah, so very cool. It's great to hear from you, Jackie. Thanks yeah, so much, and thanks. please keep in touch. <clears throat> Were you gonna say something else? Sorry. <clears throat> no, I was just trying to clear my throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just still like think it's really cool that we have a listener in Mongolia. I do too. Yeah, I love yeah. I love uh, the just the international. Uh, listen, you know, audience hearing from people from all over. So if you are from a country that, uh, that like, you know, you haven't ever heard of somebody else getting a shout out from that country, we totally, we absolutely want to hear from you. Like, so, uh, give us a shout out from whatever, you know, what, we want to hear from everybody that, that wants to, that wants to be heard from, but we especially want to, if you're, if you're at all shy, you know, and, and you're in like, you know, a country that we've never even mentioned, uh, we'd love to hear from you because those are extra cool. So, for that not reason. not that our not that our close to home listeners are yeah. any less cool. Yeah, I just said that. Okay. I'm, I, I just mean, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, it's it's extra cool when you hear from somebody like yeah, who's in from a, like a more exotic location. a country that you've never even like 
well, that you know of and mm-hmm. you've thought, man, it'd be really cool to visit there one day, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know if I'll ever get the chance, right? Um, and I wonder right. if somebody, if people there even listen to the show. You know? Right. It, no, I hear you. I so, hear you. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. All right. And then uh, another review three days ago on March uh, 23rd. And the subject of this one is Excellent Show. And this is from Solideo Gloria 7. Really a top-notch quality show filled with fascinating discussion about Tolkien's works that doesn't feel overwhelming or heavily scholarly. John and Greta are great hosts and very easy to listen to. They've helped me rediscover a love for Tolkien that had lain dormant for a little while. Give them a listen. You won't be disappointed. Oh, that's great. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you so much, yes. Soli Deo Gloria 7. We really Thank appreciate you. it. And yeah. uh, and it's, you know, we're as always, we're honored and love hearing that, uh, you know, we've helped you rediscover your love for Tolkien. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's always a, a great thing to hear from, from a listener. Definitely. All right. Um, lastly, check out our YouTube channel. Just visit TolkienRoad.com slash YouTube. I think I actually gave out the wrong address on the last couple of episodes, so my apologies for that if you were trying to find it. Uh, please go to TolkienRoad.com slash YouTube, and that'll redirect you to our uh, channel on YouTube, so you can subscribe over there. But please head on over there. Um, don't forget to subscribe and click the notify bell. Uh, I posted a, a video this week that's a, a response to the latest uh, bad news from Latron Prime. Just some some thoughts I had on that uh, quote unquote bad news, which you'll just have to go over there. I I think I have a little bit of a um, unusual take because I'll be everything I've been saying about how this is is this bad news for Latron Prime, and I have a little bit of a different take on it. So head on over there. It refers to the actor that recently left the show. All right. Uh, news and correspondence stick around to the end of the episode. All right, Greta, let's dive yeah. in, shall we? Uh, yeah. All let's right. Do it. So where are we now? So we're continuing our after the Silmarillion journey. So we're looking at the Book of Lost Tales too, right here. So okay. those of you watching on video, you can see there the Book of Lost Tales two. Are there different editions of that that have bigger print in them? Yeah, this you is know. the you know this is what they call it the um so, so like the mass market yeah mass market okay. paperback I think is what they call it this is the ones you like you know this is the type of paperback you get at the airport right yeah you know? <laughs> um when you're like oh, I need something around. I I, I cannot imagine somebody like buying this in an airport though and being like I'll I'll read this on my vacation or <laughs> it just doesn't seem like the it's not exactly a beach read not a beach read no. um but uh but yeah these are the ones this is just I got so I really want to get like a really uh, and some people have pointed me in the direction of some, but I really want to get a, a get a nice uh, twelve volume collection that's all the same. I really like the mm-hmm. larger paperback versions of of uh, Tolkien's books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I do have like you know certain books in hardcover. Like uh, I do have I, I have like several editions of the Silmarillion. I have um, and and like you know I have like the illustrated version, and then I have the uh, like a, an older hard copy ver hard hardback version um and then i have a um and then i have like lord of the rings one volume big uh hardback one volume that came out a few years ago um i really want to get a history i i I guess eventually i'll get a hardback version of all 12 of the history of middle earth but i kind of want to get just the like larger paperback version Mm -hmm. you know and i have a few of those like that but i want to get ones that all look the same on the bookshelf for some reason it's kind of hard to find that so yeah i know that it's important to you to have your series books matching i i actually like you know do a lot of reading electronically but i prefer to have you know the if for things that i like for works written works that i truly treasure i want nice copies mm-hmm. of them like mm-hmm. uh, either either a hardback or a nice paperback version of it mm-hmm. right that all like that looks really good on a bookshelf you know um it's kind of like with music if it's an album i really love i want to get it on vinyl right uh because it has that nice kind of look to it and there's just something special about putting that out uh you know playing that playing that vinyl version of it so anyway yeah yeah sorry for the rabbit trail no it's okay i was just wondering because i feel like those the print is just so small that's also part partly giving away my age probably <laughs> well so i think if think if we when we do um when we actually do a focused series on the book of lost tales i think we'll have to i'll have to go ahead and get my nicer paperback versions of those okay so i'll look forward to that all right yeah so on this episode we're providing a brief overview of the six chapters of the book of lost tales too which is the second volume in the history of middle earth series so as a reminder each chapter is roughly laid out as follows 
we have an introductory description of where the main contents of the chapter are found, i.e. high school exercise book labeled thus and such. Uh, and then we have Christopher's transcription of his father's writings, um, and then notes and commentary by Christopher, and additional relevant material and commentary for each chapter, right? So that's how we proceed. And we're just, again, we're doing a survey. We're just trying to give you an overview of what's in each chapter in this particular book. All right. So the first chapter of this one is the tale of Tenuviel, which Greta, what is mm -hmm. the tale of Tenuviel? Uh, I believe, isn't it Baron and Luthien? Yeah, it's the early version of Baron and Luthien, right? Nice. So yeah, the tale of Tenuviel corresponds roughly to chapters 19 and 20 of the Silmarillion. Um, so I'm going to read the introduction to this one here. The Tale of Tenuviel was written in 1917, but the earliest extant text is later, being a manuscript in ink over an erased original in pencil. And in fact, my father's rewriting of this tale seems to have been one of the last completed elements in the Lost Tales. There is also a typescript version of the Tale of Tenuviel later than the manuscript but belonging to the same phase of the mythology. My father had the manuscript before him and changed the text as he went along. Significant differences between the two versions of the tale are given on page uh, 40 of this book. In the manuscript, the tale is, he is headed, Link to the Tale of Tenuviel, also the Tale of Tenuviel. The link begins with the following passage. Great was the power of Melko for ill, said Ariol. If he could indeed destroy with his cunning the happiness and glory of the gods and elves, darkening the light of their dwelling and bringing all their love to naught. This must surely be the worst deed that ever he has done. Of a truth, never has such evil again been done in Valinor, said Lindo. But Melko's hand has labored at worse things in the world, and the seeds of his evil have waxen since to a great and terrible growth. Nay, said Ariel, yet can my heart not think of other griefs. For sorrow at the destruction of those most fair trees in the darkness of the world. This passage was struck out and is not found in the typescript text, but it appears in the almost identical form at the end of The Flight of the Noldoli. The reason for this was that my father decided that the tale of the sun and moon, rather than Tenuviel, should follow the darkening of Valinor and the flight of the Noldoli. The opening words of the next part of the link. Now in these days, soon after the telling of this tale, uh, referred when they were written to the tale of the darkening of Valinor and the flight of the, of the Noldoli, but it is never made plain to what to what tale they were to refer when Tenuviel has been removed had been removed from its earlier position. So, just as a reminder, there's a there's a frame narrative throughout the entire book of Lost Tales, and that actually continues into the book of Lost Tales too. Now, one and two is kind of an artificial division. There's really it's all part of the same. You know, these were just legends that Tolkien was writing in the late teens, early twenties. Um, that eventually became the primary legends of the Silmarillion. So this aerial frame narrative, right, that begins with the College of Lost play, uh, the first chapter in the Book of Lost Tales 1, is continuing, and it sets the stage for each of the stories that we're familiar with as the stories of the Silmarillion, right? So somebody is telling these stories to Ariel. Um, oh, to, yeah. oh, yeah, to Ariel. That's right. Yeah. I was thinking Ariel was the narrator, but he's not. Narrator. Right. Uh, the, the narrator is actually third person, but uh, over the over, like overall is third person. Um, but it's kind of, the, again, the frame narrative is like Ariel interacting with these different figures right. in uh, on Tol Eresea um, and learning about these legends from time past. So, yeah. Um, all right. And um, so this tale is narrated within the story, within the frame is narrated by, a character named Veane. Um, Veane. And this is one of the characters that lives in the Cottage of Lost Play or right, resides yeah. there. So Veane was a child who resided at the Cottage of Lost Play in Tol Erisea. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, and she appears only in the early stories of Ariel in the Book of Lost Tales. So, yeah. So she won't be in like book, Lost of Book Tales, Book of Lost Tales 3 or 4. Is that what you mean? There's no book. So the, beyond this, there's no there's no more Book of Lost Tales, right? So beyond Ooh. so volume two. So this is all part of the History of Middle Earth series, right? So gotcha. History of Middle Earth series okay. first two volumes are Book of Lo Book of Lost mm -hmm. Tales. Mm -hmm. The third volume, which presumably we'll get to on the next episode, is uh, the Lays of Beleriand, and what those are are actually like poetic versions of things like the Tale of Tenuviel, um, Turin. 
uh, and I believe the fall of Gondolin, although I haven't prepared my notes for that one just yet. So, okay. okay. So you're saying Vienna is only in like the Book of Lost Tales. Ve- Veane. Veane. I, I, I think that's how you would say her name. Okay. So. Yes. Only in the Book of Lost Tales as far as I know. Okay. So. All right. All right. So a little example of what this chapter uh, contains as Tolkien wrote it. All right. Who, uh, who was then Tenuviel, said Ariel. Know you not, said Alcir. Tenuviel was the daughter of Tinwe Linto. Tinwelent, said Viane, but, but said the other. Tis all one, but the elves of this house who love the tale do say Tinwe Linto, though Vaire hath said that Tenwe alone in his right name ere he wandered in the woods. Hush thee, Alcir, said Viane, for it is my tale, and I will tell it to Ariel. Did I not see Gwendeling and Tenuviel once with my own eyes, when journeying by the way of dreams in long past days? What was Queen Wendelin like? For so do the elves call her, O Veane, if thou sawest her, said Alzir. Slender and very dark of hair, said Veane, and her skin was white and pale, but her eyes shone and seemed deep, and she was clad in, film, in filmy garments most lovely yet of black, jet spangled and girt with silver. If ever she sang or if she danced, Dreams and slumbers passed over your head and made it heavy. Indeed, she was a sprite that escaped from Lorien's gardens before even Kor was built, and she wandered in the wooded places of the world, and nightingales went with her and often sang about her. It was the song of these birds that smote the ears of Twint Tinwellant, leader, leader of that tribe of the Eldar, that after were the Solus, Solusimpi, the pipers of the shore, as he fared with his companions behind the horse of Orme from Palisor. Iluvatar had set a seat of music in the hearts of all that kindred, or so Vaire sa- saith, and she is of them, and it blossomed also very wondrously. But now the song of Gwendeling's nightingales was the most beautiful music that Tenwellant had ever heard, and she strayed back aside, f- strayed back aside for a moment, as he thought, from the, from the host, singing in the dark trees whence it might come. So that's actually, you know, even though this is part of the tale of Tenuviel here. That's actually a much earlier chapter in the Silmarillion. That's the earlier version of that, right? That's of uh, Thingol and Melian, right? So um, here, Thingol is named Tenwellant, and um, Melian is named, um, what was it? It was Wendelin, right? So uh, so even here, we have earlier names that are different, quite different from the later names of these particular characters. So just an interesting little note there yeah definitely so, yeah. Uh, but we can recognize you know the the early traces of that particular story so um all right so some differences noted by christopher some of the differences here let's see do you want to read this section here greta oh sure just so it's not be blabbing all the time blah 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 okay um all right the story of Baron's coming upon Tenuviel in the Moonlight Glade, in its earliest recorded form, was never changed in its central image, and it should be noticed that the passage in the Silmarillion is an extremely concentrated and exalted rendering of the scene. Many elements not mentioned there were never in fact lost. In a very late reworking of the passage, in the lay of... Sorry. In the lay Lithian. of Lithian... Yeah. The hemlocks and the white mo- white moth still appear, and Damon, the minstrel, is present when Baron comes to the glade. But there are nonetheless the most remarkable differences, and the chief of these is, of course, that Baron was here no mortal man, but an elf, one of the Nodo- Nodoli, and the absolutely essential element of the story of Baron and Luthien is not present. It will be seen later. But this was not originally so. However, in the now lost, because erased, first form of the tale of Tenuviel, he had been a man. It is for this reason that I have said that the reading, that the reading man in the manuscript. And I think sometimes it's best to avoid Christopher's parentheticals <laughs> when you're trying to read this for somebody. Oh, I think you're right. I didn't see the... Okay. Anyway. Um... Yeah, okay. So, several years after the composition of the tale in the form in which we have it, he became a, he became a man again. 
though at that time my father appears to have hesitated long on the matter of the elvish or mortal nature of Baron. So that's the biggest difference is that Mm -hmm. originally Baron was an elf. Is that right? Right. And then he, I'm really glad he made that change. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's what Christopher means when he refers to the essential nature of the absolutely essential nature of the story, right? right? Is this idea of, uh, of the marriage of a, man and an elf mm-hmm. right or really kind of a exalted elf because you know luthien is uh actually has is half my half right, elf right, right exactly exactly um and that also obviously serves to to foreshadow the argon and um eowyn mm-hmm. right no arwen <laughs> arwen <laughs> i yeah. cannot keep those two Argorn straight. And arwen, yeah. right yeah so um it's interesting that if he hadn't changed that 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 would have removed that piece as well. Or, I mean, it, it, it just would have been the, you know, the first instance of it. It could have been. Yeah. yeah true. So, all right. Uh, of course, both of those characters are actually descendant from Baron and Luthien. Right. 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 Which so, wouldn't have worked, right? If he had kept I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I don't know if it would have, I think it would have, it would have worked just in a different way. So it, anyway, okay. it's, yeah. Moot point. Well, anyway, so Baron was originally an elf, right? And uh, and so there wasn't that 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 question within the tale originally, right? Um, a couple of uh, interesting. So at the end of a lot of chapters in this volume, there are these miscellaneous matters where Christopher includes notes on uh, particular subjects. So um, I'm going to read the headings of these sections and. You know, with the thought that I'll wh- that'll whet your appetite for wanting to go and find out what he has to say about these things at the very end. Uh, so, uh, first, the the headings of, of these miscellaneous matters in this chapter are Morgoth, uh, number two, orcs and Balrogs, number three, Tenuviel's lengthening spell, number four, the influence of the Valar. Uh, I do find it. I'm gonna read the first the first sentence of of, of number one Morgoth here because I find it humorous. Baron addresses Melko as the most mighty uh, Belcha Morgoth. So, <laughs> Belcha. <laughs> yeah, I, it's probably actually like Belka or something, but um, which are said to be his names among the gnomes. But anyway, I find it, I think it's funny just because uh, sometimes Tolkien used words that meant a certain thing to him, but then to our untrained uh, pedestrian ears, sound very mm-hmm. funny. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's true. And he's just rolling his eyes at us like. Uh, idiots uh, exactly exactly <laughs> yeah and we all are you know we all, we're all kind compared of idiots to compared him, to him for sure. yes especially yeah. when it comes to matters of language mm-hmm. um all right so that's chapter one that's a little introduction to the original version of the tale of tenubiel uh chapter two is turambar and the foloke i think i'm saying that right uh foloke so this corresponds to chapter 21 of turin turambar of the silmarillion and uh, interesting note. So, what you're, you're probably wondering, what in the world is a fo- is the foaloke? Foaloke is Quinian for treasure snake. So, dragon, right? Oh, like a snake that sits on treasure. Yeah. Or a snake that hoards treasure. Exactly. Oh, treasure oh, serpent. Treasure yes. snake. I like that. Okay. Yeah. So, cool. uh, so it's Turambar and the dragon, really. Um, introduction. Little snippet from that. The tale of Turambar, like that of Tenuviel, is a manuscript written in ink over a wholly erased original in pencil, but it seems certain that the extant form of Turambar preceded the extant form of Tenuviel. This can be deduced in more ways than one, but the other, but the order of composition is clearly exemplified in the forms of the name of the king of the woodland elves, Thingol. Throughout the manuscript of Turambar, he was originally Tentoglin, and this appears also in the tale of the coming of the elves, where it was changed to Tenwilint. A note on the manuscript at the beginning of the tale says, uh, Tentoglin's name must be altered throughout to um, to Elon or Tenthelon. But the note was struck out, and all that and all through the tale, Ten, Tentoglin was in fact changed to Tenwilint. And there is evidence that the tale of Turambar was in existence at any rate, by the middle of 1919. Humphrey Carpenter discovered a passage written on a scrap of proof for the Oxford English Dictionary in an early alphabet of my father's devising. And transliterating it, he found it to be from this tale, not far from the beginning. 
He has told me that my father was using this version of the alphabet of Rumel around June 1919. So, a little bit by way of the introduction, dates from as early as uh, as 1919. Wow. All right. This chapter is narrated by a character named Eltas. Eltas, uh, another character that only really seems to appear here. Um, and it says, uh, what I found about Eltas is that they were an inhabitant of Tol Erisea at some time during the First Age. So Eltas's family is unknown. Hmm. Yes. So what makes Tolkien so great is he just puts like these random characters in and like then just you know they're never heard from again. Yeah, and there's really nothing known about them. But that's great. It just leaves room for the imagination to to really kind of go to work and figure out. Hmm. So many of these things. Well, and and if Tolkien had had more time, he would have gone back and given all of these characters their own backstories. Oh, right? for sure, for sure. So. Yeah, but it's kind of cool that he didn't because mm-hmm. now we get to imagine what they might be like and where they came from. Right. Yeah. A uh, little example passage here. Um, so uh, here we go. When then Ilios had spoken his fill, the time for the lighting of candles was at hand, and so came the first day of Turuhalme to an end. But on the second night, Ilios was not there. And being asked by Lindo, one Eltas began a tale and said, Now all folk gathered here know that this is the story of Turambar and the Fooloke, and it is, said he, a favorite tale among men, and tells of very ancient days of that folk before the battle of Tessarinen, when first men entered the dark vales of Hisalome. In these days many such stories do men tell still, and more have they told in the past, especially in those kingdoms of the north that once I knew. Maybe the deeds of other of of other of their warriors have become mingled therein, and many matters beside that are not in the most ancient tale. But now I will tell tell to you the true and lamentable tale, and I knew it ere, I knew it long ere I trod Olore Male in the days before the fall of Gondolin. In those days my folk dwelt in a, in a vale of Hisolome, and that land did men name Ari, Ariador in the tongues that they then used. But they were very far from the shores of Asgon, and the spurs of the Iron Mountains were nigh to their dwellings and great woods of very gloomy trees. My father said to me that many of our older men venturing afar had themselves seen the evil worms of Melko, and some had fallen before them. And by reason of the hatred of our people for those creatures and of the evil Vala, often was the story of Turambar Turambar and the Fooloke in their mouths. But rather after the fashion of the gnomes did they say Turumart and the Fuithlug. For know that before the battle of lamentation and the ruin of the Noldoli, there be, there dwelt a lord of men named Urin, and hearkening to the summons of the gnomes, he and his folk marched with the Ilkorindi against Melko, but their wives and children they left behind them in the woodlands, and with them was Mavwin, knife, uh, wife of Urin, and her son remained with her, for he was not yet war high. Now the name of that boy was Turin, and is so in all tongues, but Mavwin do the Eldar called Mavoene. So uh, I like that note about uh, he left his boy behind because he was not yet war high. War high. Yes, which I assume to mean tall enough tall to tall enough to fight in to a fight. war. Yeah, I think I think dwarves might have a might take issue with that idea, right? Possibly. <laughs> yes. War yeah. high for a man. War high for a for a man. Dif- different, probably different measurements for dwarves and men yeah yeah and hobbits as well perhaps and hobbits so yeah mm-hmm. um yeah so that's our example passage there a little bit of a um did you have a question or no i just feel like i'm in very deep waters here it, I, I i feel not, the same way <laughs> like hardly treading water <laughs> well he just he he just trades in so many different names you know it's like you can tell how Tol- how so much of this was a fascination of language and names for tolkien because he's just like but in this language they're referred to as this. However, in past days, we referred to them as this. You know, it's it, it's enough to make your head spin for sure. Mm-hmm. And these are all new names, and we're we're used to referring to these people by wholly different names because those were the names that were finally landed on later. So, yeah, I'm wondering 
I'm just curious, and obviously we're very um, new. We're, we haven't gotten very far into our History of Middle Earth series yet. But I'm, I'm wondering, by doing this overview, how many people are going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go buy those and read them all right now. And how many are going to be like, huh, I'm glad that I now know that they exist, but uh, I'm not sure that I'll ever read them. <laughs> well, uh, hey, you know, that's, that's a fair answer. But, I, you know, I'm hoping that for some people it's like there's an uh, – look – there is there's a lot of good stuff in these and there's definitely oh, I'm not saying there's, not. And there's definitely um i want to spend I, I eventually want to spend the time with at least with certain parts of these um if not like doing a whole i mean i think i can i can see us doing sooner rather than later a, a series on the book of lost tales where we just go through chapter by chapter and really you know spend worthy amount of time with each chapter and dissecting it and i think doing that will actually be a you know pretty enjoyable experience um, but I can also understand for some people, it's like, you know, this is a little too academic for me, right? Mm-hmm. There's a little, mm-hmm. little bit too much just textual analysis and this sort of thing. Um, I, I like, I like just new stories. I want, you know, I want to know new stories in Middle Earth. Um, but you know, so whichever way you prefer, you know, I can kind of dig it, but hopefully some people over time will also eventually say, you know what? This is really interesting. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And you know what? At the very least, they'll be able to speak intelligently mm-hmm. about them at their next Tolkien Society get together. So yeah, it's definitely worthwhile. Def- and I wasn't trying to say it wasn't. It just made me wonder what effect, you know, like how many people are going to, it's going to encourage to read them and how many people are just going to be like, oh, good to know. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's uh, there's something we said also just for the mental exercise of it all. Right? Yes, I would agree with that. It's good to challenge yourself. <laughs> um, it, it's, I mean, you're, you're really, you're, to spend time going deep in these things is to really, um, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're enlarging your mind in a certain way. You are. Right? And so. you're, you're training it to, yes, I totally agree. I completely, because if you don't, if you don't challenge yourselves to read more academic or more uh, challenging books, like it's just, it's never going to get easier or more enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, So, yeah, a little bit of commentary from Christopher here on this chapter. At the outset of the tale, it would be interesting to know more of the teller, Eltas. True. He is a puzzling figure. He seems to be a man. He says that our people, called Turambar Turumart, after a fashion of the gnomes, living in Hisalome after the days of Turambar, but before the fall of Gondolin. And he trod Olore Male, the paths of dreams. Is he then a child, one of the children of the fathers of the fathers of men, who found Kor and remained with the Eldar forever? So, yeah. And, uh, you know, just a little bit. There's a lot more in each chapter of commentary like that from uh, Christopher. So, and, you know, I think uh, Christopher does a good job of, of raising some questions that, you know, each of us might want might, might want to know more of, first and foremost, in this chapter is, who is this guy telling the story? Mm-hmm. Uh, some more miscellaneous matters uh, in chapter two here. The headings are Baron. Uh, chapter uh, two, the Battle of Tassarinan. Um, three, the geography of the tale of Turambar. Four, the influence of the Valar. Five, Turin's age. Six, the stature of elves and men. And seven, winged dragons. Read this short note about the stature of elves and men. The elves are conceived to be of slighter build and stature than men. So Beleg was of great stature and girth, as such was among that folk. And Turin was a man, was a man and of great greater stature than they, i.e. Beleg and Flending. This sentence brings an emendation from he was a man of great size. So, there you go. Yeah. Great girth. Is that a nice way of saying he was fat? What, did it say great girth? Yeah, it did. It said uh, of great stature and girth. And, right here. Oh, so Beleg was of great stature and girth, as such was among that was among that folk. It just so says it's in comparison, were... right? Oh, yes. Okay. okay. I thought you were. I, yeah. So yeah, girth would be uh, gir- girth would be width, right? Yes. Fancy word for width. Yeah. I just was thinking of Bomber for a minute. Yes. I'm just kind of wondering how this guy would compare. But it sounds like he's obviously much taller. Right. And it's just saying, yeah, he, you know, so Christopher's point is that elves were envisioned as being more slender typically than men were. Right. So. Right. Yeah. 
Yes. Which Peter Jackson actually does a very good job of yeah. in his movie adaptations, making sure those elves are tall and lean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Supermodel elves. Tell you what. Wow. All right. Chapter three, The Fall of Gondolin, corresponds to chapter 23 of The Silmarillion. A little bit of the intro to this one. The textual history of the fall of Gondolin, if considered in detail, is extremely complex. But though I will set it out here as I understand it, there is no need, in fact, for it to com- complicate the reading of the tale. So oh, okay. this is actually something that goes back to our discussion of unfinished tales, right? Because there's a whole, like, uh, when Tolkien went back much later and tried to retell the fall of Gondolin, um, that's what's included in unfinished tales. And we talked about how, you know, this is this was intended to be a much longer story, but you know Tolkien never really got a chance to flesh it out exactly like he wanted to. So, um, this one's narrated by a character named El Elfinian, which is um, which apparently means Little Heart. Hmm. Yeah. So Little Heart, whose birth name was Ilf, uh, Ilfrin, was an elf of Tol Erisea in the first versions of the Middle Earth Legendarium. He was the son of Bronwig, was who was the Gong. Uh, and he was the gong warden of a small host of elves in Tol Arisea. The gong warden. That's an awesome job. That was an awesome show, too. Whatever happened to it? The gong show? The gong show. I, You know, I've heard of that show, but I've never seen that show. You never watched it. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's a first, guys, that I actually have seen something that John hasn't. I feel like you've seen all the things. Yeah. Oh, well. It was a good show. Take my word for it. Um, I, I'll take your word for it. Thank you. I shall. Good. His title referred to the gong Tombo, which he had owned for much of his life. He served as a guide for a time to Ariel during Ariel's sojourn in, uh, sojourn in Tol Erisea. At the Cottage of Lost Play, he once narrated the story of Tuor and the fall of Gondolin. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I'll write a little snippet from this chapter. Then said Littleheart, son of Bronweg, Know then that Tuor was a man who dwelt in very ancient days in the land in that land of the north called Dor Lomin, or the land of shadows, and of the Eldar, the, Ol- the Noldoli know it best. Now the folk whence Tuor came wandered the forests and fells, and knew not, and sang not of the sea. But Tuor dwelt not within them, or dwelt not with them, and lived alone about that lake called Mithrim now hunting in its woods, now making music beside its shores on his rugged harp of wood and the sinews of bears. Now many hearing of the power of his rough songs came from near and far to hearken to his harping, but Tuor left his singing and departed to lonely places. Here he learnt many strange things and got knowledge of the wandering Noldoli, who taught him much of their speech and lore, but he was not fated to dwell forever in those woods. Thereafter, tis said that magic and destiny led him on a day to a to a cavernous opening down which a hidden river flowed from Mithrim, and Tuor entered that cavern seeking to learn its secret, but the waters of Mithrim drove him forward into the heart of the rock, and he and he might not win back into the light. And this, tis said, was the will of Ulmo, Lord of Waters, at whose prompting the Noldoli had made that hidden way. Then came the Noldoli to Tuor and guided him along dark passages amid the mountains until he came out in the light once more, and saw that the river flowed swiftly in a ravine of great depth with sides unscalable. Now Tuor desired no more to return, but went ever forward, and the river led him always toward the west. Hmm. So, there nice. you go. There you have it. little snippet from Tuor and the Fall of Gondolin. Um, this is a pretty long chapter. Um little commentary here from Christopher. The image of Gondolin was enduring, and it appears in the glimpses given in notes for the continuation of the later Tuor. The stairs up to its high platform and its great gate, the place of the fountain, the king's tower on a pillared arcade, the king's house. Indeed, the only real difference that emerges from the original account concerns the trees of Gondolin, which in the former were unfading. Shoots of old from the glorious trees of Valinor, but in the Silmarillion were images made of the precious metals. On the trees of Gondolin, see the entries Bonsil and Glingol from the name list given below. The gift by the gods of these shoots, which blossomed eternally without abating to Inwe and Nolome, 
Noleme, at the time of the building of Kor, each being given a shoot of either tree, is mentioned in the coming of the elves and in the hiding of Valinor. There is a reference to the uprooting of these of those given to Noleme, which were gone, which were gone, no one knew whither, and more had there never been. But a deep underlying shift in the history of Gondolin separates the earlier and later accounts. For whereas in the in the Lost Tales and later Gondolin was only discovered after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, when the host of Torgon retreated southwards down Sirion, in the Silmarillion it had been found by Torgon of Nevrost more than four hundred years before, four hundred and forty two years before Tour came to Gondolin, and in the fell winter after the fall of Nargothrond in the year four ninety five of the sun. In the tale my father imagined a great age passing between the Battle of Unnumbered Tears and the destruction of the city. Unstaying labor throughout through ages of years had had not sufficed to its building and adornment whereas whereat folk travailed yet. Afterwards, with radical changes in the chronology of the first age after the rising of the sun and moon, this period was reduced to no more than in the in the last extant version of the tale of years of the first age, thirty eight years. But the old conception can still be felt in the passage on page 240 of the Silmarillion describing the withdrawal of the people of Gondolin from all concern with the world outside after the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, with its air of long years passing. So it was originally supposed to be a very long time um, between the Battle of Unnumbered Tears and the fall of Gondolin, um, but it was uh, con condensed greatly for the final version of the Silmarillion. All right, a uh, couple of miscellaneous matters. Here's the miscellaneous matters from this chapter. Number one, the geography of the fall of Gondolin. Number two, Ulmo and the other Valar in the fall of Gondolin. Number three, orcs. So more on orcs. Number four, Noldoran in the land of willows. Number five, the stature of elves and men. And number six, Isfin and Aeol. So. Good yeah. deal. Good There's, deal. I, I'm, I, I, I mean, I want to just know more about orcs. So, you know, I'm like, anytime I can read more about orcs, I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Something about orcs, something. You want to, like, it's always, I don't know. It's just always fun to learn a, a lot about the uh, bad guys. Yeah, I agree. Bad guys are fascinating. About the villains. Mm-hmm. So. Well, a good villain can make or break a story. Mm-hmm. And a movie. Yeah. Anything. You got to have a good villain to have a good story. Well, and good villains, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number and the more complicated, the better. True. Mm -hmm. Chapter 4, the Nauglafring. Uh, this corresponds to chapter 22 of the Silmarillion. All right, so what is the Nauglafring? It is the necklace of the dwarves. We come to know the last of the original lost tales to be given uh, consecutive narrative form. Uh, we come now, sorry, we come now to the last of the original lost tales. This is contained in a separate notebook, and it bears the title, the Nauglafring, the necklace of the dwarves. The beginning of this tale is somewhat puzzling. Before the telling of the fall of Gondolin, Lindo told Littleheart that it is the desire of all that you tell us the tales of Tuor and of Eärendil as soon as may be. And Littleheart replied, It is a mighty tale, and so twined is it with those stories of the Naglafring and of the Elf March, that I would fain have aid in the telling of Ilios here. Thus Littleheart's surrender of the chair of the tale teller to Ilios at the beginning of the present text, so that Ilios could tell of the Naglafring, fits the general context well. But he should not expect the new tale to be introduced with the words, but after a whole silence fell, since the fall of Gondolin ends, and no one in all of the Room of Logs spake or moved for a great while. In any case, after the very long fall of Gondolin, the next tale would surely have waited till the following evening. This tale is once again a manuscript in ink over a wholly erased original in pencil, but only so far as the words sate his greed on page 231. From this point to the end, there is only a primary manuscript in pencil in the first stage of composition written in haste, in places hurled on to the page with a good many words not, certain, not certainly decipherable. And a part of this was extensively rewritten with the tale with, while the tale was still in progress. So, so this necklace, mm -hmm. is this kind of like... Um... Is it not? What's my question? So the Silmarils are not part right. of the Lost Tales, right? Yeah. So is this necklace kind of meant to be kind of like the Sil, like kind of take the place of the Silmarils? Um, no, I don't think so. This is okay. this is actually, I believe, it's something that actually survives 
it's been a while since I've read The Ruin of Doriath, but I believe it survives into the final tale of the Silmarillion, right? And it's the reason that the dwarves um, oh. end up killing Thingol, right? It's because there's some kind of like feud and then over this over this necklace and then Thingol insults the dwarves, right? Like it's really, you know, kind of nasty because Thingol was kind of nasty. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just insults the dwarves and they get really mad and they kill him. Right. I, I believe okay. I believe the necklace is so still this there. Necklace but again, is in the Silmarillion. Okay. Again, you know, it's been a while since I've read it. So gotcha. okay. Uh, but but again, this this was apparently that was apparently supposed to be a much longer tale as well. So really, what we see here is there's like five legends of of Beleriand that were supposed to be kind of like the main legends, which were Baron and Luthien, um, Tale of Turin Bar, the Tale of Turin, um, the Fall of Gondolin. The Nagla Fring and uh, the and then the story of Erendil, right? So those were supposed to be like the five sort of big stories of the later years of um, well, really of Balerion. So the period of the First Age after the fall, uh, af- after the darkening of Valinor, and you know th- and these are the stories that take place in Balerion. So gotcha. Um, yeah. So a little snippet from this from this chapter. I keep this a little shorter and would have marked. But after a while, silence fell, and folk murmured, Erendil. But others said, Nay, what of the Nauglafring, the necklace of the dwarves? Therefore, said Ilfiniol, leaving the chair of the tale teller, Yea, better would the tale be told if Ilios would relate the matters concerning that necklace. And Ilios, being no wise unwilling, thus began looking upon the company. Remember ye all how Urin the Steadfast cast the gold of Glorund before the feet of Tenwilent, and after would not touch touch it again, but went in sorrow back to his Alome, and there died. And all said that the t- that that tale was still fresh in their hearts. Behold, then said Ilios, in great grief gazed the king upon Urin as he left the hall, and he was weary for the evil of Melko that thus deceived all hearts. Yet tells the tale that so potent were the spells that Meme the fatherless had woven about that hoard, that even as it lay upon the floor of the king's halls, shining strangely in the light of the torches that burst there. Already were all who looked upon it touched by its subtle evil. Now therefore did those of Urin's band murmur, and one said to the king, Lo, Lord, our captain Urin, an old man and mad, has departed, but we, ha- but we have no mind to forego our gain. Then said Tinwalent, for neither was he untouched by the golden spell, Nay then, know ye not that this gold belongs to the kindred of the elves in common? For the Rodothlim who won it from the earth long time ago are no more, and no one has a special claim to so much as a handful save only Urin, by reason of his son Turin, who slew the worm, the robber of the elves. Yet Turin is dead, and Urin would ha- will have none of it. And Turin was my man. All those words, the outlaws, at those words the outlaws fell into great wrath, until the king said, Get ye now gone, and seek not, O foolish ones, to quarrel with the elves of the forest, lest death or, or the dread enchantments of Valinor find you in the woods." Neither revile ye the name of Tinwellant, their king, for I will reward you rich, richly enough for your travail and the bringing of the gold. Let each one now approach and take what he may gas, grasp with either hand, and then depart in peace. So, little that's our little snippet from the Nauglafring. Um, and then a little bit of commentary from Christopher on this one. In this commentary, I shall not compare in detail the tale of the Nagla Fring with the story told in the Silmarillion. The stories are profoundly different and essential features, above all in the reduction of the treasure brought by Hurin from Nargothrond in a single object, the necklace of the dwarves, which had long been in existence, though not, of course, containing the Silmaril, while the whole history of the relation between Thingol and the dwarves has changed. My father never again wrote any part of this story on a remotely comparable scale, and the information of the published text was here of the utmost difficulty. I hope later to give an account of it. While it is often difficult to differentiate what my father omitted in his more concise versions, in order to keep them concise, from what he rejected, it seems, to, it seems clear that a large part of the elaborate narrative of the tale of the Nagla Fring was early abandoned. In subsequent writing, the story of the fighting between Urin's band and Tenwellen's elves disappeared, and there is no trace afterwards of Ufedhin or the other gnomes that lived among the dwarves, of the story that the dwarves took half the unwrought gold, the king's loan, away to uh, Nograd to make precious objects from it, of the keeping of Ufedhin hostage, or of Tenwellen's refusal to let the dwarves depart, 
of their outrageous demands of their scourging and their insulting payment. Hmm. So apparently yeah. originally Nagel offering was a much longer tale and it was condensed later on. And Christopher thinks that Tolkien actually just rejected a lot of what he had originally written instead of just, you know, however, I mean, I'm like, why not have it longer? Right. Give me more. Yep. Tell the, to tell the story you're going to tell. Well, Maybe he had people like me in mind when he concised it. Well, I'm, I'm okay with the concise version too, but you know. Yeah. But you can you can tell a tale in different ways, right? You can, there can be different tellings of tales. That's true. That's why. Um, that's why. Uh, what's the abridged versions of novels exist? True. Yeah. Yep. Just give me the highlights. Highlights. That's I'm kind of a highlight kind of person. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for those books where it's like, um, I remember <laughs> late. Les Mis, I remember reading that at one point and, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's like the, the actual narrative is extremely compelling, but then like every other chapter is like just some like aside that has, no, that seems like it has nothing to do with the actual story. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, it's, and it's, that's, that's how Moby Dick is. Um, mm -hmm. it was, I guess it was a really popular thing in the 19th century and like the early 20th century. Cause I feel like, um, like the grapes of wrath does that too, if memory serves. So you'll have like one chapter where it's like, okay, this is all kind of part of the mm -hmm. you know main part of the story mm -hmm. it, following the narrative and then the next chapter is just like what does it have to do with anything yeah i kind of feel like uh winds of war is like that too because you'll have the story and then there's just like a chapter of like battle plans and like war strategy and stuff and yeah, i know you loved that i, I find that me, really interesting i was like i just <laughs> skipped over it i was like is there anything in here that's gonna like make me not understand the rest of the story no okay I'm but see it. like to me here we go on a side just a quick aside to me, like I find that relevant to the story because it's told from the perspective of a character in the story, and um, like writing his kind of analysis of the war much later, and and it's a book about World War II, right? So mm -hmm. yes, it steps outside of the main narrative, but it kind of sets the stage for whatever part of the book is coming next, right? Mm -hmm. Because it talks about like you know the Battle of Midway, right? As a historical analysis and then it goes into telling a story through the eyes of the characters in this story um so but with i always but i felt like with moby dick or something it was just like here's an essay on whale blubber you know <laughs> it's, it's like well that's it, relevant because moby dick is about a whale well yes you're right mm -hmm. you're right I but it's right. like but it but it's not just an essay on whale blubber it's like it's like an essay on the existential Con consequences of whale blubber so <laughs> of whale of yeah. harvesting whale blubber you mean which honestly if i had that in, in uh in one of tolkien's works i would i would love if there a chapter was like you know some analysis on some you know something from tolkien's world so i don't know i guess it's just all what you're into but it is it's a personal <laughs> preference kind of thing yeah yeah all right moving on uh chapter five the tale of Eärendil. So this corresponds, obviously, to the last chapter of the Silmarillion, chapter twenty-four. Introduction for this one: the true beginning of the tale of Eärendil was to be the dwelling of Sirion's mouth of the Lothlim, uh, this, at Sirion's mouth of the Lothlim, the point at which the fall of Gondolin ends, and the coming there of Elwing, the point at which the tale of Naglafring ends. Um, yeah, the matter is complicated, however, as will be seen in a moment. But my father's also making the Naglafring the first part of the tale of Erendel. But the great tale was never written, and for the story as he then conceived it, we are wholly dependent on highly condensed and other and often contradictory outlines. There are also many isolated notes, and there are the very early Erendel poems. While the poems can be precisely dated, the notes and outlines cannot, and it does not seem possible to arrange them in order so as to provide a clear line of development. So... Okay. Yeah. So this this one were really, you know, again, the problem with the story of Erendel was he never really wrote a definitive prose version of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's really only outlines that we have. Interesting. Um, so, uh, but this is still a cool chapter because there's four poems at the end of it. So let me give a little bit of uh, Christopher's commentary. He says, I have already noticed the remarkable, noted the, re no, I have already noticed the remarkable fact that there is no hint of the idea that it was Eärendil who, by his intercession, brought brought aid out of the West. Equally, there is no suggestion that the Valar hallowed his ship and set him in the sky, nor that his light was that of the Silmaril. Nonetheless, there were already present the coming of Eärendil to Kor, Tyrion, and finding it deserted, the dust of diamonds on his shoes, 
the changing of Elwing into a seabird, the passing of his ship through the door of night, and the sanction against his return to the lands east of the sea. The raid on the havens of Sirion appears in the early outlines, though that was an act of Melko's, not of the Fanorians, and Tuor's departure also, but, with Id- but without Idril, whom he left behind. His ship was Alcarame, Al- Swanwing, afterwards it bore the name Earame, with the meaning Seawing, which retained in form, but not in meaning, the name of Earendel's first ship, Earame, Eagle Pinion. It is interesting to read my father's statement made some half-century later in the letter of 1967 referred to above concerning the origins of Erendel. This name is in fact, as is obvious, derived from Anglo-Saxon Erendel. While first studying Ang- Anglo-Saxon professionally, I, I had done so as a boyish hobby when supposed to be learning Greek and Latin, I was struck by the great beauty of this word or name entirely coherent with the normal style of Anglo-Saxon, but euphonic to a peculiar degree in that pleasing but not delectable language. Quick side note, that's like, that, that just, for some reason that reminds me of Einstein. It's like most kids would be like, you know, I'm supposed to be studying Greek and Latin, so I'm going to, but instead I'm playing video games or something right, or like right. drawing doodles. Like Tolkien's like, I'm going to study an even more obscure language, mm-hmm. right? Um, kind of like... Greek and Latin just wasn't challenging <laughs> kind enough. Of like, kind of like Einstein, like failing his math classes because he's like trying to do like, you know, deeper math. He's just like, this, yeah. is, this math's boring, right? Right. Um <laughs> <laughs> true genius. The mark of it, maybe one of the marks of a true genius there. Agreed. Um, also, its form strongly suggests that it that it is in origin a proper name and not a common noun. This is borne out by the obviously related forms in other Germanic languages, from which, amid the confusions and abasements of late traditions, it at least seems certain that it belongs to astronomical myth and was the name of a star or star group. There's a much so this is a pretty long essay on the origins of the name Erendel. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's pretty long. But if you'd like to know more about what Tolkien himself had to say about that, read this chapter. Um, All right, the titles of the four poems we have here. Um, Eala Eärendel Engla Beorthast, which is translated The Last Voyage of Eärendel. So... uh, What language is that? I believe that's Anglo-Saxon. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, Old English. Old English, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, Is the poem written in Old English as well? No, it's not. It's written in... Uh, modern English. Okay. Yeah. So the second poem is The Bidding of the Minstrel. This poem, according to a note that my father scribbled on one of the copies, was written at St. John Street, Oxford, in the winter of 1914. There is no other evidence for its date. In this case, the earliest workings are extant, and on the back of one of the sheets is the outline account of Arendel's great voyage. The poem was then much longer than it became, but the workings are exceedingly rough. They have no title. To the earliest finished text, a title was added hastily later. This apparently reads, The Minstrel Renounces the Song. The title then became The Lay of Erendel, changed changed in the latest text to the bidding of the minstrel from The Lay of Erendel. The third poem is The Shores of Fairy. I'll read a little bit of this. East of the moon, west of the sun, there stands a lonely hill. Its feet are in the pale green sea. Its towers are white and still, beyond Taniquetil in Valinor. Comes never there but one lone star that fled before the moon. And there the two trees naked are that bore night's silver bloom, that bore the globed fruit of noon in Valinor. And there's more to that poem, but those are a couple of uh, the first first bits of it. So, and then chapter four, or the fourth poem in this chapter is the Happy Mariners. So, um, and this one was written in 1915, and uh, is a little longer than the other ones in this chapter. So, yeah, okay. always cool to see little bits of poem. I, I just I really love Tolkien as a poet. So. He's my kind of poet, you know. And it always, like, fascinates me when authors, not only have they written, like, this amazing story, but then they are masters of poetry as well, that they insert these, you know, little bits of gems into into an already well-constructed story. It's like, man, some people have all the gifts, right? Yeah. Storytellers and poets and, yeah. Yeah, especially when it yeah it, it provides this little, con, you know, context. It's a, it's a cool literary achievement, but mm-hmm. it also, I don't know, it, for some reason, it adds depth to the story. Too. It really does. So, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, chapter six is the history of Ariol or Elfwine in the end of the tales. So the introduction reads, in, the, in this final chapter, we come to the most difficult, though not, as I hope to show altogether insoluble, part of the earliest form of the mythology. Its end with which, it's, with which is intertwined the story of Ariol, Elfwine, and with that, the history and original significance of Tol, er- Tol Erisaia. For its elucidations, we have some short pieces of concocted of connected narrative, 
but are largely dependent on the same materials as those that constitute Gilfannon's tale in the story of Erendel. Scribbled plot outlines, endlessly varying, written on separate slips of paper or in the pages of the little notebook. In this chapter, there is much material to consider. And for convenience of reference within the chapter, I number the various citations consecutively. But it must be said that no devices, no device of presentation can much diminish the inherent complexity and obscurity of the matter. So another very obscure chapter here, but uh, this was maybe meant to you know give the background on Ariel, right, mm-hmm. and connect him to, uh, and connect him to Elfwine. So, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, let's see a little taste of the content here. So fade the elves, and it shall come to be that because of the accompanying waters of this isle, and yet more because of their unquenchable love for it, that few shall flee. But as men wax there, and grow fat, and yet more blind, ever shall they fade more and grow less. And those of the after days shall, shall scoff, among who are the, saying, Who are the fairies? Lies told to the children by women or foolish men? Who are these fairies? And some, shall, and some few shall answer, Memories faded dim, a wraith of vanishing loveliness in the trees, a rustle of the grass, a glint of dew, some subtle intonation of the wind, and others yet fewer shall say, Very small and delicate are the fairies now, yet we have eyes to see and ears to hear, and Tavrobel and Cortirion are filled yet with this sweet folk. Spring knows them in summer too, and in winter still are they among us, but in autumn most of all do they come out, for autumn is their season, fallen as they are upon the autumn of their days. What shall the dreamers of the earth be like when their winter come? Hark, O my brothers, they shall say, the little trumpets blow. We hear a sound of instruments unimagined small. Like strands of wind, like mystic half-transparencies, Gelfanen, lord of Tavrobel, rides out tonight amid his folk and hunts the elfin deer beneath the paling sky. A music of forgotten feet, a gleam of leaves, a sudden bending of the grass, and wistful voices murmuring on the bridge, and they are gone. But behold, Tavrobel shall not know its name, and all the land be changed, and even these written words of mine be like will all be lost. And so I lay down the pen, and so of the fairies cease to tell. Mm. So, I mean, you know, Tolkien really had this whole, all conceived out in a way, you know, whether he had it all written down or not. But I mean, he has kind of an end to this whole mm-hmm. affair of the Book of Lost Tales, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even to the frame narrative. Uh which is interesting thing. It's interesting that, you know, it was just the frame narrative was something that he abandoned, you know, at the end uh, or later in life or just didn't really come back to or emphasize as much. Uh, I, again, I kind of contend that, you know, I think we kind of missed out on having a frame narrative for the Silmarillion, right? On a, on a good frame narrative. I think, I think in a lot of ways it was a great idea and it could have really helped people to get into the story, especially mm-hmm. it had been told by uh, hobbits and familiar, other familiar characters of the third age later on. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, lots of poems in here. Um, I, I actually won't list off all of them, but there are a good number of uh, of things at the end of this chapter. Uh, one of them is the Song of Ariel, right? So, uh, in unknown days, my father's sires came, and from sun to sun took root among the orchards and the river meads and the long grasses of the fragrant plain. Many a summer saw they saw they kindle yellow fires of flag lilies among the bowing reeds, and many a sea of blossom turned to golden fruit and walled gardens of the great champagne. So, yeah, I mean, you know, again, love, I, I really do love Tolkien's poetry. Um, and then at the very end of this chapter, there is a, uh, there's a, a section called Elf Wine of England. And in that section, um, I believe Tolkien relates Ariel to Elf Wine and this legend of uh, ancient England, right? And in, att- in an attempt to connect this, all to being a ancient history and ancient mythology of England itself. So there you go. There we go. So that concludes our survey of the Book of Lost Tales, both volumes. I hope you found this informative as an introduction to the works and look forward to diving into these at some point in the not too distant future. I know I do. So Greta, you may be a little apprehensive. It's a lot, but um, yeah, apprehensive is a good way to. Put it. <laughs> but we'll, you know, when we if when and if we do it, we'll make sure and do it at a at a reasonable enough pace to, uh, you know, to make it something enjoyable and and also make an effort not to get too lost in the weeds. Uh, this is yeah, it, I think that's the trick there. You, you, I hope at the very least, even if you're like, eh, I don't know if I'm gonna go back and read that, you kind of have a little taste of what yeah. of what Christopher had to put into each of these mm-hmm. volumes to. Mm-hmm like 
to make this a reality, right? I mean, this yeah. this is truly like, I it's I, I posted something on Twitter a couple of days ago, and I was like, you know, it, I, I basically referred to this like it's it's a lot of just head splitting like textual analysis. Like, there's a lot of it's it's not a it's not easy to go through this stuff, uh, but I think there is a lot of very interesting and rewarding matters that. Uh, that Tolkien fans who want to go deeper will mm -hmm. get a lot of enjoyment out of and find yeah. out, you know, th there's, I mean, there's just a lot of nuggets of, of gold, you know? Absolutely. And even for those who, you know, maybe like me, like you said, are a bit apprehensive and maybe won't, you know, want to spend the time actually going deep into these, it at least gives you even more of a taste That's right. of, of Tolkien and the extent of the universe that he created mm -hmm. the legendarium that he has i mean it's truly mind-boggling i agree yeah all right let's talk about a little news a uh, couple of couple of not huge but uh things worth mentioning from uh tolkendom this week first of all um on uh march 24th uh lord of the rings lord of the rings on prime uh shared a latron prime latron prime yes, yes shared a couple of images on twitter Oh. One was a um, like I don't even know what you call these, but the the film clip thing that they always and they go action and they like clip the thing down. Um, I guess it's a nice like black and white photo of uh you know of a nice looking beach scene, mm -hmm. and uh, and it says director Wayne Yi Wayne Che Yip, and a director I guess D O P which something with production is Aaron Morton. Um, so apparently, uh, and then it was confirmed that this. Director Wayne Che Yip, who has uh, is not super well known, but has directed uh, like a, a lot of episodes of TV shows in the past, is apparently a um, uh, is a uh, director and now co executive producer of the show. So, hmm. yeah, interesting. Yes, indeed. So, uh, do we know what other TV shows he's been involved with? Uh, you know, I didn't link to it. I'm just curious. So, uh, but you know what, people. Go check it out for yourselves yeah. and find out. I, I did look at it and I just didn't re like I recognized some of the things, but they weren't like things Nothing that stood out to me or, or things okay. that I had, you know, I was super familiar with. So gotcha. um, the other news from this week is uh, Project Northmore uh, was unsuccessful. So they did not raise Aww. enough money to buy Tolkien's house in time, uh, the, the Northmore house. Uh, so the house ended up being sold to somebody else. Um, however, they are going to uh, move ahead with trying to set up a retreat center somewhere in Oxford and with other plans that they had. So you can go read about that on the projectnorthmore.org website if you're interested in learning more. So, All right. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know that I'm deeply saddened by that. I mean, I'm not deeply saddened. It, I think it would have been interesting to see what would have come of it if they had been able mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been neat to maybe go to uh, Tolkien's house and have it be a place where you can actually go in and visit. That's true. I guess um, so. It was basically sold privately. Now it's now a private yeah. re residence. Okay. I don't know. Maybe somebody else is going to turn it into. Maybe somebody else turn it into a Tolkien museum. I don't know. Um, maybe. But yeah. So Project Northmore did not succeed in uh, what it was aiming to accomplish there, but they have other plans that they're following up on. Okay. All right. Um, have some emails, uh, some correspondence to share from some listeners. All right. First off, a couple of emails from Marilyn, the librarian. Marilyn. First one is funny. Uh, she's, uh, this is from March 22nd. She says, Hi, Carswells. Here's today's version of UK school exercise books. So this goes back to our whole, like, what's an exercise book? So Marilyn confirmed for me that uh, Tolkien was not likely referring to a book of exercises, of physical exercises, like but I to had thought. right, <laughs> but to uh, to what I thought of as a as a blue book, right? Uh, so w when I was in college, oftentimes we did our exams in what were called blue books, and they were these standard form books that you just wrote in and pen and you turned it in. Uh, also, you can think of them like as being the like nicer sort of journals that sometimes uh, you see people writing in. Um, but yeah, this is, this is not a, uh, book of physical exercises I'm so deeply much. deeply disappointed by so, this. So I'm gonna try to remember to link to some of these images that Marilyn shared, uh, just so you all know, but these do go back. She shared an image from one, uh, from Australia in the 1910s, right? So, oh, uh, and okay. they were called exercise books back then. So I think that kind of confirms that's what Tolkien was talking about. So. All right. I stand corrected. Yeah. And she says, nowadays we call them blue books in the States. Though they were mo they though they were used mostly for exams, so all right probably because if we did call them exercise books these days, most people would be like, I don't want an ex I don't want more exercises to do. <laughs> Save me from exercise. Please no. 
All right. And then another note from Marilyn is uh, the subject is Tavro Bell in the House of a Hundred Chimneys. She says, hello, Carswells. Once again, this is some profoundly personal mythology that Tolkien constructed from events in his life during his wartime experience. Hammond and Scholes, J.R.R. Tolkien, artist and illustrator, says, In spring 1918, when Tolkien was assigned to a camp of Pink Penkridge in Stratfordshire, the family, baby John had been born in November of 1917, found lodgings nearby in a house named Gypsy Green. Tolkien made many drawings in, of, and around the house. Again, Hammond and Scuttle and Skull write, the chimneys are so prominent in Tolkien's drawing of the house as to suggest that Gypsy Green was a source for the House of Hundred Chimneys at Tavrobel in the Book of Lost Tales. Oh. In his mythology, Tolkien equated Tavrobel with Great Haywood, another Stratfordshire village near Gypsy Green to which he had been posted earlier. And then she links to a blog post about the house, the area, and the bridge. I'll try to remember to share that. Um, uh, let's see. Be sure to scroll down until you see the drawing Tolkien made of Gypsy Green and its chimney, so you can see the drawing in this particular, um, in this particular blog post that he made. So, oh, I see. So oh, it's yeah. a, it's worth checking out there. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then she says, "Here's the bit about the bridge. Of this time, John Garth says, in his absence, Edith had traced his movements on the map on her wall. Mm. Until now, any knock at the door could have brought a dreaded War Office telegram." His return to Great Haywood was thus an emotionally charged moment, which Tolkien marked with a six stanza ballad, The Grey Bridge of Tavrobel. Garth gives us this elegaic poem uh, of return. O oh, tell me, little dem demoiselle, why smile you in the gloaming, on the old grey bridge of Tavrobel, as the grey folk come a-homing. I smile because you come to me, o'er the grey bridge in the gloaming. I have waited, waited wearily, to see you come a-homing. In Tavrobel things go but ill, and my little garden withers. In Tavrobel beneath the hill, while you're beyond the rivers. I long and long I, ha I have been away, or sea and land and river, dreaming always of the day of my returning thither. Hmm. All the best, nice. Marilyn. That's beautiful. Yeah, so really, uh, really cool bridge, poem. Is this a, um, oh, sorry, was this bridge part of, like it was mentioned in one of the the chapters of the lost tales i believe so yeah i believe okay. in the book of lost tales well i can't remember which which chapter exactly i don't okay. have it pulled up in front of me but uh yes i believe so gotcha okay uh, she has a couple of PA, uh postscripts it was frodo who sang the man in the moon the man in the moon and the prancing pony he slipped off the table and the ring slipped on his finger as he fell down okay. right that's what i was thinking of uh the language of my greeting is finished, the inspiration for the Quenya language and the source of the poem Calervo, which in turn inspired the tale of Turin Turambar, with an additional bit from Sigurd the Dragon Slayer. And then I prefer to think of my links and bits of info as knowledge balloons. Bombs just aren't my thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Moms aren't really, uh, you know, at the end of the day, bombs aren't really no. uh, anybody's, anybody's things, uh, hopefully. No. So, uh, or in a better world would not be anybody's things, I guess we should say. So. Yes, balloons are good. Yeah. Uh, and they're explosive in their own way. Yeah, just do a lot less damage when they do explode. Do a lot less damage, unless there's water in them. Unless they're water balloons. Yeah, but that's fun damage. It is fun damage. So so maybe maybe we can meet halfway with Marilyn and call her, her little tidbits knowledge water balloons. Knowledge water balloon bombs? Yeah. No, just no <laughs> no bombs. Just knowledge, knowledge water, water balloons. Knowledge water balloons. But they just, just drench NWBs. us. NWBs. Drench us with amazing knowledge exactly all right exactly. fair enough yeah well thank you Marilyn. yes thank you uh next note is from as a follow-up from duran Ayer, our new uh our new correspondent from finland uh duran Ayer, of course wrote an ep that epic note i think we read on the last episode hello tolkien road pavers love it first of all thanks you pretty much nailed the duran duran Ayer. all right yes all right. I meant to write back sooner, but heard John's father was in a bad way, decided to give it some time. Mm. When I wrote my list on how I got into Tolkien, there was a mix-up. I didn't read Silmarillion after Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. It was the unfinished tales that first introduced me to the first stage and got me really interested, especially the Nari mm. Hin Hurin, as I wanted to read a more complete story of it. All the while, my friend had been name-dropping the Silmarillion. <laughs> Thus, the unfinished tales served as an appetizer, Leaving me, leaving me wanting far more, and honestly quite confused at the time. Enter Silmarillion. Hmm. I was listening through your enjoying Tolkien or Reasons Why, and you mentioned Tolkien's intention for artists to expand on his work. Here's several artists and bands worth mentioning who have done some or all of their music based in Tolkien's stories. 
Now these are more or less my preferred genre, metal, but listening to them instantly takes me back to Arda. So, oh. so yeah, I, you know, I'll read, I'll read off who these are. I'm going to say, uh, I mean, go check them out by all means. These probably are not going to be for everybody because they are metal, which is, uh, you know, most of you probably know what, uh, you know, what metal is. So, uh, it's, it's a more extreme form of music as, as you would say. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I like a good bit of metal, so I'll probably check out a lot of these. I've heard of the first one you mentioned, Blind Guardian, for sure. Know them well as being, they incorporated a lot of Tolkien's mythology into their music. Um, he also uh, lists off Battle Lore. Uh, this is a Finnish band. Uh, almost all of their songs are in English, and every album is about Middle Earth. Hmm. The vocalists take turns, each contributing their t- their own tone to a different narrative phrase, not unlike music of the Ainur. Oh, neat. Yeah, so... And then um, Summoning, an Austrian artist with two guys who don't do gigs. By their origins, they fall into black metal, a category which you can still hear in the guitar, but lately has been described as atmospheric metal, which sounds more accurate. Horns, flutes, and piano melodies are are amazing. Wow. So Okay. Yeah. So anyways, anyway, these are all for you to try and listen. If some of them uh, strike a middle earth and chord in your ear, wouldn't dream of imposing my personal taste of music on something else. Uh, on someone else, no, not at all. I mean, and uh, thank you for sharing. Mm-hmm. I like I said, I'd heard of Blind Guardian, never heard of Battle Lore or Summoning, but uh, yeah, I think I'll go check those out and see what I think. So they both sound very, very interesting. They do. So, yeah, I definitely want to hear like the music of the Ainur kind of style here with Battle Lore. That sounds yeah, really interesting. that does sound really cool. So, yeah, great to hear from you, Duran Ayer. Mm-hmm. Always, as always, and uh, please keep in touch. Indeed. All right. Um, a couple of notes. You know, I think I'm going to save these because this episode's gone a little long. I think I'm going to save these next two notes um, for the next episode. Well, uh, hopefully, we had some people share some thoughts on uh, frame narratives, and so um, would love to hear from more of you on stories with frame with frame narratives uh, on that question. So, if you can write in between now and next time, that'd be awesome. And hope and we will try to do a little theme on our correspondence for next time. Oh, so. that sounds nice. All right. Yeah. All right, so uh, you can reach us, Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com, TolkienRoad.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Starting to get more consistent with Instagram, so check us out over there too. On our next episode, we will continue our survey of the history of Middle Earth with Volume 3, The Lays of Beleriand. Sounds good. That's all for this episode. Thank you to our amazing patrons, especially the following Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien, Lise Yu, Andrew T, John R, Ms. Anonymous, Shannon S, Brian O, Emilio P, Zeke F, James A, James L, Chris L, Chuck F, Azia V, Ish of the Hammer, Teresa C, David of Pints with Jack, Jonathan D, Eric S, Joey S, Eric B, Matt L, Johanna T, Sam N, Mike M, Duranayir, Robert H, Paul D, Jacob S. Thanks, guys. Good job on Duran Ayer. Thank you. I've been practicing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but and uh, and another shout out to Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien for celebrating her patron anniversary this month. Yes, so. thank you. All right, well, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye, bye. <laughs>